Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you to Representative Grand for the uh, lovely introduction. And we do welcome you in Arizona anytime you want to come. There's a lot of uh, people from the Midwest and the can Canada, especially, who enjoy getting away from the winter, harsh winters there in the Midwest. But uh, it truly is a privilege to be with you here this morning. I want to first start off by acknowledging the Heartland Institute for organizing this event and organizing what I feel is a very important conversation about the current and past policies that impact our energy and our environment, but more importantly, these policies that impact very vulnerable uh, communities here in the United States. In particular, I'll give you some perspective of how these policies impact uh, my area on the Navajo Nation. To this morning, I stand before you uh, representing and growing up in very unique communities. Uh, my, my district in the southwest of Arizona, uh, our communities are directly impacted by a coal economy, as well as a Navajo Nation as a whole, uh, whose future is very much dependent upon this natural resource. But before I begin, let me uh, introduce myself by custom in our native language. She Carlisle W. Begay, and she had quotes called Nishlenki, Ani, a Bashishin, Adot Lazatlan, that should say, though that should nala. My clans define me as a Navajo, it defines me as one and where I come from, and by custom, it also gives relations to those uh, in our community. First of all, I want to give perspective on what many would probably agree here, uh, the precious natural resources, what I feel specifically in terms of, when I say natural resource in my context in the Southwest, I mean the intersect of both natural resources like coal, but also the intersect of this natural resource and the dependency of this as it relates to also water policy. In the Southwest, our conversations when we talk about energy, coal, it also has a very much important impact as well when we talk about water policy. But these precious resources, and especially from the context of energy and water, have shaped much in Arizona's past, and it continues to shape much of Arizona's present, and will certainly figure primarily in Arizona's future. It's also important to note that in truth, Arizona and the Southwest as a whole would not be what it is today or would not be where it is today if it weren't for these rich natural resources. These natural resources continue to be a dynamic component of our state and will continue to be a vital factor in the health and strength of our economy, not only in the Southwest, but really across the country. All economic activity in this country more importantly in the southwest in a very semi-arid desert area, our region in the southwest relies very much on our energy and water supplies. But let me give you some context of the community that I am here to talk about. The Navajo Nation in the southwest is located in the Four Corners region. It encompasses over 27,000 425 square miles. It is reminiscent of the entire state, the size of West Virginia, to give you a size comparison, and occupies land in the states of Utah, New Mexico, and the majority of the Navajo Nation uh, occupies the state of Arizona and within the district that I represent. Of the 500 recognized tribes in the country, and of the 318 reservations, the Navajo Nation is the largest population, has the largest tribal membership with a population of over 300,000 tribal members that currently live within the boundaries of the Navajo Nation alone. In comparison, in terms of land size, again, the Navajo Nation is actually bigger than 10 states here in the US. So it's a good comparison when we look at policies, when you look at representation, uh, we have a pretty large geographic area in land mass and in population that uh, is impacted by policies. 
But of the 300,000 tribal members that live within the Navajo Nation, less than half are actually able to make a living within the nation with many others that move away for jobs, for education, for opportunity. Currently, the Navajo Nation has an unemployment rate of over 50%. And growing with the population as economic development as a whole remains stagnant. Currently, the Navajo, General, Navajo Nation's own governmental general fund and operating fund uh, and the budget represents about 60% of that revenue in coal. 60% of their general fund comes from royalty from coal itself. The remainder of the budget is comprised of external, firms, external funds, largely from the federal government. In a recent study, the economic impact alone from coal and the Navajo Generating Station, which I'm sure many of you have heard of in the, the recent year or two, the Navajo Nation economy as a whole, in this report by the W.P. Carey School of Business at Arizona State University, found that coal and the power generation will boost the Navajo Nation economy by over $13 billion over the next 25 years. $13 billion. This coming from an economy that is often compared to as a third world country, with many of our communities on the Navajo Nation with no basic amenities like running water and electricity. In fact, my childhood was a childhood of uh, in a very, growing up in a very simple lifestyle, a lifestyle that was based very much on our traditions and culture. It is not from my grandmother's standpoint. I was raised by my grandparents. Not having running water, electricity wasn't as a result of our economic circumstance, but really as a result of the life that my grandmother knew her entire life. Coming from a grandmother who never stepped a day, a foot in, in a, of her day in, in the classroom. She's never formally been educated, but the wisdom and teaching our culture and traditions continue to live in something that I really have uh, seen as a very important part of my life today. As we look forward to the future for the Navajo Nation alone, the Navajo Nation in terms of energy policy has identified four key areas for their future and especially as it relates to their energy policies. First, a, a big priority for the Navajo Nation as a, as a whole is to continue to expand on current jobs and revenues realized by their current energy portfolios and policies, including coal. Next is to expand and identify and diversify their energy portfolio and transition energy production into and consideration of alternative and renewable energy sources to meet the future needs of our communities and our people. The third area is to focus on areas to ensure that the Navajo people have access to a more reliable and commercial energy grid where, as I mentioned, much of that does not exist currently. And fourth, and the most important that I feel, is to strive to keep our balance with Mother Nature and the needs of our people. Our culture is based on a kinship, based on the balance we call hojon, meaning when we look at life, life is about balance. And unfortunately, when we talk about energy policy, especially the polarizing views of energy policy, they're not often balanced. And our perspective is how do we find in this debate oftentimes a middle ground? And I think that's a continuing effort by our Navajo Nation government and certainly by my perspective as a Democrat who is speaking at a climate change conference, which is not very common. But the Navajo Nation mine currently consists of mining 8 to 10 million tons of coal each year, down from actually 13 to 16 million tons before EPA regulations began to take its toll on our resources and we still have billions of tons of coal to feed our Navajo Nation economy. Additionally, from this natural resource, we actually generate approximately 3,750 megawatts, megawatts of electricity 
sold primarily off the Navajo Nation to feed our, our growing economies in Arizona and the Southwest. Uh, this industry continues to provide over 2,000 high paying jobs on the Navajo Nation. And as I mentioned before, it represents 60% 60, 60 of our general fund revenues. These revenues represent the Navajo Nation's ability to act as a sovereign nation. It's an important revenue that meets the definition of self-determination in my view. I often argue that as a tribal community and as a tribal nation, we are truly not sovereign without our ability to be self-determined. And natural resources like coal provide some of that and will continue to provide some of that self-determination for our future. To the extent that the Navajo Nation in the past year has bought its own coal mine, if you haven't heard, the Navajo Nation from, has purchased the Navajo mine from BXP and seeks to gain a greater control of our resources. So what has dynamically changed for us in the Southwest is now the Navajo Nation is not just only a stakeholder in this discussion of energy policy and coal, but has become a shareholder in this process as well. This, from a policy perspective, has shifted the complexity and discussions of partnership and collaboration among governments, not only as we look at federal energy policy, but also from my standpoint, state legislative policy, or even in a local government, county or city and town governmental policy, tribal communities like the Navajo Nation have a seat at the table. Dynamically very different than even a decade or a decade before where tribal communities like the Navajo Nation were considered just a stakeholder in these discussions. As we continue to fight the EPA Clean Power Plan and the potential impacts of these policies on the Navajo Nation alone, there were provisions that were created that allow, for example, in the state of Arizona, we are continuing to press upon EPA to allow us as a state to implement our own state implementation plan but within that context, what we lobbied for is to uh, have the ability to enter into what we call multi-jurisdictional state tribal partnerships. Essentially what this represents is allow us as legislators, state legislators, to be more proactive and rather than reactive to oftentimes non-progressive or in, in, in a lack of foresight policies allows the state government, the state legislature to work collaboratively with the Navajo Nation and really balance the future of not only the state of Arizona, but the future of these communities. So one of the last things I want to highlight before I run out of time here is that when you look at the future of our region and our country in the United States and Arizona in particular, the importance of partnership and collaboration. Uh, my effort in the past couple of years as a state legislature is to change that dynamic for our tribal communities. In my legislative district alone, I represent eight tribal communities, the largest legislative district in the country. But a big push for me personally is to change the dynamic in which our state government, our federal government works with tribal communities. A government, government relationship that is founded on the foundation of partnership not consultation. This is true government to government and allowing our governments to work collaboratively together. The vision that I leave for you this morning and often that I press in the public is that the future of the state of Arizona is going to be very much dependent upon a partnership with our tribal communities and vice versa. That is the future. Tribal communities will be a stakeholder, will be a shareholder and I continue to press that when we look at policies that they are well rounded with the communities that are impacted in mind. So I thank you very much for allowing me to be here and look forward to answering any questions.